So, um, the, the real theme of this talk is remembering. And uh, I'm being reminded. <laughs> um, I was once told by a teacher a long time ago, uh, it's not hard to remember. It's hard to remember to remember. And at the time I thought, oh, that's just so brilliant. But actually, I think, it, it, for me, it goes a step deeper, and, by, and I'm not going to talk about that now. I've sort of divided this talk into several sections, and the last section is about that. So, and maybe some way of closing up this talk as best I can. Um, so, not the only reason, but one of the reasons I'm doing this is, uh, since I've been back, everyone's asked me, so what was it like? I'm like, I, I couldn't even begin to say, you know, like in a kind of a short conversation, what it was like. And, not only did I feel like I didn't want to try to say it like 50 times, but I felt like it would, it would be important for me to kind of really answer that question for myself. And, and in the course of thinking about all this, stuff has come up that I completely forgot about. So, uh, so you're getting to enjoy my process as well as hopefully uh, be entertained or whatever. Um, so Joel said, so what are you going to call your talk? What, what's the blurb? So I just scratched down, I sent it to Todd. In this brief multimedia presentation, Mark will summarize his year of solitude in Western Massachusetts. The ups, the downs, the ins, the outs, the successes, the failures, the music, the news, and everything in between that the aspiring retreatant needs to know and avoid to make their time away deep, meaningful, and worthwhile. <laughs> and, and many people I've talked to have come up to me and you know, said, so is it going to be funny? <laughs> no. <coughs> well, maybe a little. Um, so one thing I want to say in, in the intro part of this is that I might be, I will be sharing some personal things and, and my goal in, in sharing stuff that's like uh, maybe more personal is not that I'm looking for either pity or accolades or anything like that. I, what I'm looking to do is uh, share that which, which I think would be helpful because we have so much in common. And it might be that if these particular things aren't true for you, it's like something is true for you. And I think we process things in many of the same ways. And so that's part of the purpose of doing this is to be helpful, if possible. Um, so things that are true for me may be true for you too. Um, so I've been thinking actually about what Sangha even means in this light. And I didn't think of this before, before. But in a way, to me, what Sangha means is like we're one person. It's not like I'm having this experience and we're all having these separate experiences. Like we're all having one experience. It might have individual aspects, but the sharing of those experiences is, I think, um, what Sangha is. It's not just that we do it together, although sitting together in silence is great. Um, so I'm, I'm doing this partially in, in that light of um, sharing experience. As a matter of fact, as a plug, uh, when I was a newsletter editor, it was like pulling teeth to get anybody to submit anything to the newsletter, like an insight or whatever. It's like, what's the matter with you people? <laughs> You know, like we're a sangha. So, anyway. Um, it's not my thing anymore, so I don't even have to plug it. Uh, oops. I touched the microphone on me. So, uh, briefly, uh, I did a, a session at the Monroe Institute. My, John Robert Monroe was a, a guy who started having spontaneous out of body experiences back in like 1950s and 60s. And the whole institute grew up around his work and his mapping of, of that. And uh, at this place, there was a doctor from India. And, and, he, and we were talking about philosophy and what, was, what their view of karma was and out of body, whatever. And he said, in India, there is the philosophy that individuals don't have souls. There are group souls. And a, 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 group, a soul group could be like 500 to like several thousand people. And that bit, I don't know how to say it, that, that soul would come down and have an experience to go back up to wherever. I, I, this is just a story, but this was just kind of corresponds to what I'm saying. And, uh, and everyone would share in that being's knowledge. And that soul group would then only evolve or move on to the next, well, that next level, whatever that is, when everyone had gotten everything that everyone had done. And that's, how, and that's exactly what Monroe had said. It was very interesting that he said the same thing. So in that light, I'm hoping this will be helpful. I'm already going too slow here. Um, Okay, so a number of things are going to come up that's actually really hard for me to put into words. For example, uh, and I'm going to be showing some um, little videos and pictures and stuff, which haven't come up yet. Um, for example, the beauty of where I was was amazingly beautiful. It was so beautiful 
that when I first got there, I remember walking outside like, just sort of like in the cold, cold, quiet, cold winter. I'm like, this is so awesome. Like, I remember thinking, I can see why people would live in the country, in the cold, in the quiet. I was just like, but they had this here, you know? But for some reason, it took going away to like, kind of like, wow. And so anyway, I was really moved by that a lot. And that isn't going to come across what I'm saying about my experience. So I'm showing, part of the reason I'm showing pictures, I want, I want to really try to communicate that that, as you'll see, there was a lot going on. I was doing a lot, not like the retreat. That, that's why this is a joke. But, um, but interspersed with all that doing were these moments of like, oh my god, it is just ridiculously beautiful. Sometimes I just go on the porch and just kind of like, you know, now, tear up. You know, it's like the sun came through every night. It was like, I just stand there. So um, I'm saying this as a preface because it's not really going to come through in, in my description, but that was a part of the experience. Um, I'll skip that. Uh, and, and about the next point, I think I'll just say that um, before this experience, I had never lived alone before in my life. Maybe for, in Israel, like for one month, I had an apartment for myself, right before and I, and I met. <clears throat> and uh, that more or less ended the alone time. <laughs> I was glad of it at the time. But I remember afterwards thinking, you know, there was something about that I wasn't done with. I couldn't say what it was, but I loved living alone. And so when people ask me, well, weren't you lonely? It, like, I wasn't. I wasn't lonely. I felt, first of all, no. I, I, <laughs> more at, <laughs> after one of our retreats, more had written down some of the things that people had said in the last sharing. And most of them were funny. <clears throat> and, and the one she quoted me on was, um, I have minions. You know what minions are? Yeah. Pardon? No? No. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm not going to try to explain. Anyway, I'm, I got a lot of stuff to keep me coming. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> but if you ever run across minions, you'll, it'll be funny. Um, okay, so let's see how this works. Okay, so um, I imagined before this happened, uh, I was planning to come up, and then, you know, I had this idea in my head that, like, I'm sort of making this thing to do, and God is also, it's right around the beginning of the year, God's like looking at his plan. And um, making what he, and, and he sees, oh, Mark Hurwitz planning a retreat. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. Not so much. Uh, it, it really didn't conform to my plans at all. Uh, and often doesn't for other people, too. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, so uh, thinking I would not go down to Florida again, this is the first big joke, um, I flew down there to say, you know, to see my mother who's now dealing with my demented father and that's a whole other story I'll, I'll share later. I'm thinking, okay, and I'll see you in a year. That's really funny, um, as you'll see. So, um, so, so this is the plane ride up from Florida on January 31st to Hartford, where I then drove uh, to the car dealership, where I had bought a car, sight unseen, used car, uh, that was a four-wheel drive, which I thought I would need in the snow, which was right. And, um, and I drove home. This is called the shark's head. This, for, I guess I just found this out. It's been for 40 years, although the lights are new. Um, somebody, I think it's some neighbor, this is a rock outcropping, right? Our house is right, right down there. And someone just goes up and paints a shark's face on it. It's like a yeah. local landmark. So I call it the shark's head house. So that's me right before pulling in for the first time. There's a short video. I made videos for my family. This room, this is like my room. You can see how, how big it is or how not big it is. That's it. Um, but it had been that the... Okay. So when I did this before, it wasn't hooked up to this TV, so we might have a few glitches. If so, I'll just skip the videos, although that would be too bad. Okay. So uh, that's the car I bought, and that's the car kind of the next day, sitting out in front of the house in the snow. Uh, that night, uh, the previous night, so I had moved the bed, took, took the bed off the bed frame, I put it on the floor in the corner, and they had heat, heating, you know, the kind of like water, uh, radiant heat. And I'm laying there in bed, it's 2 in the morning, and I'm like, I open my eyes, I wake up, and I look over, it's dark, but there's moonlight coming through, and I see smoke rising up the curtains. I'm like, shit! And I get up, and I run, I go to the light, and I turn around, and it's like, I, it was a dream. But I woke up, and I opened my eyes, and still, it was so real to me that, okay, first night. <laughs> okay. 
So uh, one of the things was that I discovered early on uh, when I, so I was going to be paying the utilities and heat and stuff when I was there, and I called up the, the oil people to ask them, you know, so when's the last time the oil was paid, what do I need to do? And uh, the oil bill came in at 700 something dollars. So I called them up and said, whoa, so when's the last time that was paid? Like, how much time is that for? He said, a month. A month? <laughs> I'm not paying $700 a month for oil. Like, so all of a sudden I had all this stuff to do, including turning down the heat. So, <laughs> so the heat would come on and off, and, and the house, this old wood house would crack and pop, and the, the beams would expand and stuff, and so I'm there, and it's loud. It's like, <laughs> it sounds like people in the house. For the first two or three nights, <laughs> it sounds like people in the house. And I was... Uh, afraid, actually. Uh, and I'm going, it's just the heat, you know? And, uh, later I came to love it. I really like sound. It's like, oh, God, that's my friend. But for the first two nights. And then, uh, the, uh, the second night, so, uh, so I'm in the living room sitting. I've got my space. And I'm sitting there. It's about 10 o'clock. And I'm done. And I open my eyes. And I see some movement. And I kind of glance up. Now, this window, but everything's closed up, right? And... Going up the bricks of the fireplace is this, what looked like a big rat, like that big. And I'm like, whoa. So is this like the fire that's not really there? So I get up and I walk over to the other side of the room, maybe this far, right? And I get there and I look up and it's gone. I'm like, where could it have gone? It's a closed house. You know, this thing just went up and disappeared. And I'm like, shit, now I've got the people in the house and this thing. And I sleep naked and every, the whole the doors aren't closed. And I'm like, so I went to the back of the living room and I stood there. I said, hey, you can't be in here. <laughs> Never saw him again. <laughs> that was it. No, no droppings, no nothing. And he just said, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I got to where uh, this thing of being inside, this house is pretty big. I wasn't using all of it for most of my space, but I could hear like everything. And I got to where like if, if the tea was boiling and I was on the, I was like, I got really sensitized to it and I really like that. There's something about being so tuned in to everything. If like it got too cold and like something's wrong with the heater. Like I would know if it was a degree off. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so I'm changing topic now. I'm just running here. I, I'm, I'm going too slow actually. <laughs> Time out. So, um, this, so this is in honor of Hiromi. For those of you who, who oops, sorry, who are at her talk, Hiromi did, did a, 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 a street retreat, and she had to be on the street, and she was wearing for her talk what she was wearing on the street, and so this is what I wore pretty much every day for a year. Um, I did wash, but uh, and this is okay. This is my first piece of advice for people that want information on how to do a retreat. So Hiromi said on her retreat. Her favorite thing was her hefty bag. Because she could, she could cover with it, she could be cold or warm, and it was protection or whatever, she can carry stuff in it. So, I brought this as my crop. Oh, thank you. I found this there. I love this blanket. It, it's just... <laughs> so, if you want to have a good sitting practice where you really feel comfortable and spiritual and deep, you need a hefty bag of some kind. That's that prop. Prop. Okay. Um, I had an interesting experience. Joel often talks about how um, if you watch yourself and you're at a restaurant or whatever and you're trying to decide what you're going to eat or what you're going to make to eat, like, how does that happen? How is that? And I remember, so I cooked basically pretty much twice a day, every day for the whole year. And uh, at a certain point, like, I go in and what am I going to make? And I just watched it happen. I, had, I completely stopped thinking about it. It was so interesting. I didn't plan anything. And all my meals were great. I mean, they were. Re I don't cook that good here. I don't know why. But, um, you send pictures. Huh? Uh, yeah, no. Well, I'm, I'm, you're going to see the pictures later. I, I, that's later. Um, so that was really fascinating. It, it was part of getting in the flow of it. Like it's just happening. Like I, I don't really have to be involved in that. I know how to cook, so I don't have to go about it. I can just go, pull, make, good. It's all good. And that was, there's something reassuring about that. It's like one more thing I don't have to do, which of course is what this whole thing is going to be about, as you'll see. I think that that's... So these are just some of the pictures of 
the beauty of the place. That's the back porch and the back, uh, the woods in the back. Okay, so that, that's, my, that's my outfit. I had, a, I had a beard for a little while. I didn't get tired of it. Okay. Um, oh, I think the reason this is here is um, when I first got there, within a few days my back started hurting. And I realized, oh, I'm sitting. Normally I don't sit. I have a standing desk. It's like, okay, that too. Now I have to build a standing desk for myself because my back hurts. So this is what the desk looked like when I first got it all set up. And then I went to the store and borrowed some tools and got all this wood and everything and then built risers for everything so I can now stand here and everything's at more or less at that height. Hmm. It was just another thing I had to do to make the place mine. There was a lot of things like that, but... Um, okay, so this is my man cave here. It is just gonna, this is just a swivel of what my room looked like. This is where I was most of the time. <clears throat> this is out of order though. This is actually in the summer, so you can see it's not winter out there, but um, that's just, these aren't all exactly in order. This is what my man cave. <laughs> <laughs> I never had a man cave before. I recommend it. Those are my dad's, uh, my dad was a, uh, he composed and he had some shows on Broadway and those are some of the posters from his 1980s mm -hmm. shows. Okay, so. Uh, okay. so I thought we should commemorate the Sharks Head well, House, his first oh. fire <laughs> 25 years. Oh. Good thing collecting cardboard. It's good. Hot too. Well, most of these videos are I was sending my family just as my like my sort of travel log, whatever. But th that place had, that, that had never been used in 25 years. So I got there. I'm like, no one had ever lived there in the winter. That was the first one. So um, I talked a little bit about the. Uh, let me get my glasses for this. So, yeah, I talked a little bit about how beautiful it is, and amazingly beautiful it is. And I'd go out as much as I could, although it was really cold. And the wind blew. I mean, it was around zero, t below 20 for a lot. So that's the living room, uh, which I rearranged a little bit more. But that, so, yeah. I have to say more about that. So this, that was it. That was the scene right there. When I turned, and I thought, this is amazing out here. Actually, <coughs> Because I think it captures it because it's, it's not nice, but it's, you know, mm -hmm. and that's just our driveway right there, it goes down. So I didn't have to walk very far to feel like I was away. I don't want to take too much time with this, I already feel like I'm behind, but um, I, I really want to, it was, it's just magical, so. Man, it's no way. So I'm going to go through these fast. So those were winter. Then, uh, can I? <coughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll zoom through these. This was how I figured out how much it had snowed. It, it, it worked really well because the guys that came to plow, they wanted to plow as often as possible. I wanted to plow them as little as possible. So I use this as my way to go. You know, this is spring. <sighs> yeah. It almost seems simple to rush through these, but I have one at a time. All right, so you get the idea. I, I, I so, so, um, one, so one of the things we'll talk about later was we had to end up replacing the whole oil system. We got propane and I had to go out there and paint this tank, prepare to paint, paint it. And while out there, I came in and I'm like, and I had a tick on me. There, that's a big deal. As a matter of fact, the government called like a, it's a state, uh, what's the word? Uh, epidemic. Like, and, and everyone I talked to, I did IQ for a while, everyone there had, been, had had Lyme disease. Like, what? Like, so I'm like, I'm not going outside anymore. I got freaked out by it. You know, I was like putting rubber bands on my uh, ankles and stuff. So it really took, took the um, verb out of me to go outside. I had to be really careful. Um, 
Okay. Moving on. I'm good. Okay. So uh, the next section of my talk is called doing. Oh wait, wait, wait. Oh. People go fast for these. So during the spring, um, I walked out right between like the kitchen door and the garage door. There was like a, a, a little planter box that a, that a starling had met a nest in. I go out, I'm like, oh, wow, look at that. Next day. Next day. Next day. This is cool. And I just go out the door and she'd fly away. She wouldn't stick around. And so I started just kind of watching like this. Oh. Okay, I'm glad everybody's doing that because you know how when you have a baby or a puppy and yeah. you go from being a normal person to, oh, she's the cutest little thing. Well, everyone's doing that and I did the same thing. It's like talking to these birds. Oh. Oh. They are. They were like, it was crazy. And this was, this was one day after the next. This is like no time has gone by. This, there aren't many things like this, but I, I thought this was just kind of extra special. Okay, and so, and so this last one is, uh, I'm getting ready to go away. Mm -hmm. And? Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Oh, no. This is the next day. So, okay, on day three, I'm leaving to go to Florida again. It's another part of the story. And um, I'm thinking, how long is it going to be before they're out of this nest? I'm going to be gone for a week. And I think, they'll be gone. This, this is it, you know, because they're going so fast. Um, so here they are, like, almost grown, like, in three okay. days. Okay, it's June 27th. And I predict that when I get back here, these guys oh. will be gone. Hey, guys. Wow, they're like three times bigger than I started in three days. Hi, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll leave that for now. So, okay, the next part of this talk is called doing. It's sort of broken into parts. It's not all necessarily chronological, but um, I was pulling stuff from emails I'd sent as, as part of my journal, and this quote I really like, and then the retreat started. <laughs> Uh, and that kept coming up. Like, I, I wrote to people many times, I'd say, you know, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm really going to kind of get down. And like a month ago by, it's like, I'm just almost done, and then it's, and it just kept going. And that became part of the lesson. So I'm just going to read you the stuff I, I'm just going to read you the stuff I had to do for the house when I got there. Because my parents are now 90, they were, you know, uh, uh, they've lived there for 25 years, just in the summers. My dad, according to my mother, couldn't boil water. Like, he, he's just, he never lifted a screwdriver or nothing. So there's a lot that didn't happen there. When I got there, it's like there's all the stuff that needed to happen, including weatherizing the house. So I said I would do stuff when I got there, having no idea that there was going to be insulating the whole house, uh, finding out what the different discount programs are for the price of heat, switching from, heat, from oil to propane, uh, dealing with the propane tank, Replacing lights all over the place. So anyway, so these are these are the curtains I put up that are you know heat you know curtains. Um, I was putting up plastic over those windows, which just talk about deferred maintenance. That middle window, I took off the little handles on the windows um, to put the plastic over them, and that middle window was open. This is at the top of a vaulted ceiling. It's been open for 25 years. No one's been up there. Of course, it's freezing in here. Like, like really? So. Um, uh, well, I'll just I'll just jump to the so, yeah as complicated as it just looks. This is the simplified version when it was the oil tank in there. Uh, the oil tank apparently had a crack in it, and if it has a crack, what happens is it kind of drips out, and water again feeds in. But if there's uh, antifreeze in the water, that drips out, and then you have water with no antifreeze. And if the power goes off, which sometimes it does, that means that there's no heat, which means when the pipes freeze, and then when it warms up again, your, your house is destroyed. So it was something that had to be done. I'm like, really? So where do I write this? And I have to <laughs> hire contractors and get zoning permits and like, it was just. <laughs> but then my retreat will start. <laughs> so, and then there was the other thing that was written. So I had to clean the garage and get rid of this generator. There's just no end. Putting up lights. Um, okay. Forgive my French here. I was tired. You'll see. Oh, God. 
how to fucking die. That's what the power was. Which it did. Uh, so the guy that was going to help me, who backed out at the last minute, he was planning on putting in scaffolding and doing the whole job with scaffolding and a helper and whatever. I did the whole thing with a ladder. Oh, okay. And when people heard I'd done that, it's like, I would not have permitted you to do that. Um, I don't know if you can tell how high up it is. It's like, it's higher than this. I'm like, like that the whole, for two days, two whole days. I was, so, it's all part of the retreat. Um, so this is, so all the trenches got full of leaves, so I had to basically blow them all out. I spent a whole day, I, I took my arm out of its socket. Because, oh, we had a leak in the ceiling that turned into a drip, and there was all this rot that happened. This is right over my bathroom toilet. And it just uh, needed to be done. It just keeps going. And none of this is my stuff. This is the house's stuff. Smelling here. Coming through this wall. So, oil in the when the guys put in, put in the, with the propane system, something about the oil line had a drip in it. We couldn't figure out what this was, but this, this room downstairs under the kitchen had this really bad smell. It smelled like, like someone sprayed WD-40 or like, like, whoa, just wafting up from this room. And we couldn't figure out what it was. And finally, what it turned out to be is oil in the ground right outside on the other side of that wall that was just coming through. We couldn't figure out what to do. So I'm like, okay, we'll just put in a window fan and just leave it run. Apparently it's worked because the guy just told me it's kind of stuck. With the fan. Anyway. Done. Done. That became my word. Done. Oh, and then there was the chimney, which also. <laughs> um, I didn't have to do that work, which was good, although I did have to work with these guys who were just morons. <laughs> but they did eventually. They finished it. I wrote the check to them the day before I left in, in March. So, yeah. Okay. I worked. Um, Did the retreat begin now? Uh, <laughs> well, Soon. funny you should ask. Um, so I wrote to a friend, I still have a lot to do before I cannot do. That's from an email. And I realized later that maybe retreat was not the right word to use in describing the experience. Um, so, so, but actually this does uh, get more seriously to, to what was really going on in me. Um, I did want to get away, so I did want to retreat in that way, but I didn't really know what I was doing, and it took me a long time, maybe by the time I got, after getting back, to realize what what was that? What was that? Because okay, so that all that stuff I just showed you, that was stuff for the house that I got there. and Realized when I got there, I need to take care of this stuff, and there was more too. Uh, I don't know if I can do this quickly. Uh, I want to just like read to you, and these are just in alphabetical order now everything I brought with me to do, or with the intention of doing while there. Because it's like, I've got a year, a year, oh my god, with nothing else to do, no problem. <laughs> I couldn't do this list in five years. No way. Oh. It was like, I brought everything in my life that I'd never finished, didn't finish reading, didn't finish trying, everything. I had boxes of papers and, and, and CDs, like I thought, okay, I've got like these 50 like, CDs and DVDs, and movies. I'll just watch one a week. Seems easy. And at the end of the year, I'll have gone through them all. And I was like that with everything. I had this program I was trying to do. Um, I had exercise and breathing exercise and all this computer stuff to do, like uh, throwing away all music or even going through old email. Every day, just throw 50 emails away. You know? And by the end of the year, it'd be like, I figured, like 17,000 emails. I'm like, wouldn't that be great? To, just another thing. 50 emails. It'd take 10 minutes. <laughs> All kinds of stuff on the computer. I was I, I uh, mostly completed a movie script, which I'd love you to look at sometime. Um, it's not quite done. Yeah, I'm in your free time. Uh, so I wrote that to finish that. I, I was uh, volunteering for uh, an organization called the New Energy Movement until last December, where because of a number of things, I said, okay, I'll just keep being secretary treasurer until they find somebody else, which of course they didn't. So through June, I was still doing that. Um, uh, my father wrote, he was commissioned by the governor of Florida in 1986 to write the Florida Welcome Song. And, uh, and he did, and, and the Florida Senate voted for it, and, and nothing ever happened with it. And so for a long time, he's been really like, why did something happen with my song? I want it to be used, play the football games, whatever. It's an awful song. But uh, <laughs> it sounds a little bit like a Delta Airlines commercial. You know, Fly Delta, you'll, uh, it's, ugh. But, um, but I went to work for him there. He couldn't get any traction with, you know, calling the government in Florida, so I did that for him, and eventually actually got him 
uh, a slot at the, they had this, uh, this nine month uh, exhibition of Visit Florida, great, Florida's great, whatever, and his song is playing there. So that was good. By the time I showed it to him, I gave it to him on a CD, he didn't remember he'd written a song. <laughs> you know, timing, timing. <laughs> okay. Uh, you get the idea. You get the idea. I don't have to go I mean, listen, I've got another like 30 things here. So you get the idea. Uh, practicing Qigong, doing, is Maura here? The other Maura? So she, she teaches sometimes this, this sit of eye exercise where you can teach yourself to see clearly without glasses. And I did her course with her. And it was great, but I didn't really throw myself into it. I said, okay, I'll be there. I'll just do those there. Not once. <laughs> anyway, so jump to the end. Jump to the end. Uh, just for lack of time. What time is it? Oops. Ooh, it's 12. Uh, what, half an hour? Yeah. Uh, so basically what happened was I had, so I had to look at it. Not because I sat down and said, I need to figure this out. It's just the, the impossibility of doing all this. It's just like, it's, it wasn't just impossible, it was absurd. And the absurdity of it just sort of, just kind of washed over me, continued like, what's driving this? Like, what do you think you're going to get from doing all this? Um, are you going to be better? Um, and what part is going to be better? Why, why would you drive your life this way? Um, this is the part where I actually want to slow down and see if I can say something that might be more helpful than entertaining. So I felt while there, I was thinking about dukkha, dukkha. And I noticed that I have two kinds of dukkha. You know what, everyone knows what I mean by dukkha, right? No. So, so when the Buddha said, life is suffering, as it's translated, the word for suffering is dukkha. And, and what it really means, according to my understanding, maybe someone wiser will clarify, if not, it means unsatisfactoriness. It means wanting it to be different, better. It's not, it's not good enough. So I, I'm not happy. It needs to be more of something. Um, so I noticed that I had like an external, I had external dukkha, like I, I don't like it if, if, if I go outside and there's a lot of bugs. Um, you know, I'm going back inside. Well, different things in my environment, I'm just not happy with. I just, I, I need it to be different. I'm not going to be happy until it's different. And then internally, I noticed, I was sitting on the couch once, towards the end, and everything was great, you know, the weather was great, I just eaten, it was all good. I'm on the couch, it's like, I'm not happy. Why? Why aren't I happy? Like, what, what, what is that? It's nothing external to me. And I'm not actually immediately experiencing anything internal. Like, it's not like something's going on, like I'm, I'm nervous about the guy who's going to do an inspection or something. I'm just sitting there. And so, I, I'm, I may be jumping too far ahead, but I'm, I'm going to say it now, because uh, now is when I'm going to say it. So at, at, a, at a retreat, uh, three years ago or whatever, I had this, I'm sitting, I had this stream go through, almost like a color stream go through that felt like it was coloring everything. And I realized that stream or that texture in my mind was duke, it was like not good enough. I just realized that thing, not good enough. I'm not good enough. I, I felt that. Um, but later on I realized that's not what it is. I thought that's what it was for a long time. And then I realized it's not that I'm not good enough, it's that I'm not prepared enough. Ooh. Not prepared enough. Prepared for what? Well, uh, I was choked when I was young, four years old. I won't tell the whole story, but at the time I was completely unexpected. I was sort of playing at the time, and it kind of came at me, and it's like, you know, the world's not safe. And that, even though I don't feel that anymore, that thing is still there. And that, that unconscious energetic need to be ready. Just ready, is there all the time, and that's the dukkha. It's like, fuck, I don't want to be that way. I don't want to have to feel that all the time. Now, of course, the only way out of it is, is to go through it, which I'll talk about more later, but um, uh, someone we know had given me some marijuana oil, a tincture, and I didn't do it for like nine months. I just, I didn't do, I, I didn't, there were eight beers when I got there. There's still, you know, I didn't finish them in a, in a year. I, didn't, I wasn't drinking either. Um, and I thought, you know, I'll try it. And, and I, the thing says, 
One dropper, mellow, you know, sleep. Two droppers, buzz. I'm like, okay, well, I don't, I've got to be careful with pot. So I took maybe not even a full dropper. And, you know, for the first, and then nothing, and then, oh, I feel good. And I'm laying there, like, this feels nice. I'm visionary, beautiful. And then I just start to shake. In bed, I'm shit, and I, I get freezing cold. I mean, I can't warm up. I'm dressed in bed with extra blankets. I can't uh, warm up. Like, I was shaking so hard, I pulled my neck out. I was sh shaking. And uh, finally, I just went to the bathroom. I turned on the hot water. I took a bath. But, but while that was happening, I'm like, I'm petrified. I'm afraid. There's this fear. And as it's going on, and I'm going through it, I'm like, I'm not actually afraid. I don't feel any fear of anything. It's just this thing. And as soon as I got in the hot bath, it just went away. So I realized that there's this undercurrent, this energetic undercurrent, which some people perceive intensity of me. I personally don't see it, but I know people do. <laughs> and, uh, and that's really what it is. It's like this, this sense of like always having to be just ready. Um, and that, so when I was looking, so why do all this stuff? Why go through? Why? And that's why. Oh, well, fuck it. Or maybe that's not the right way to say it, and maybe we'll have to edit the tape. But uh, it just suddenly seemed like, well, the obviousness of, of why not to do that. Like, it, it wasn't, none of this was thought out. The whole thing, I, I, I was trying to express this before, none of this happened by planning. It just all happened. The cooking happened, the insights happened, the struggles happened. It's just like, oh. And something just let go mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, and I don't want to say it's like gone, like let go like that, uh, but um, there was a change. Um, there, there's a great poem that I, I heard a long time ago, because I realized that time is part of this, time. Like it's not just doing stuff, it's, there's nothing wrong with doing, and I don't have a problem with doing, but it's like the anxiousness that goes into it. I gotta finish it, because there's so many things to do. Okay? So the poem was, I, I, I couldn't find it. I went looking for it. Someone read it to me years ago. Basically, this woman is a farmer. She works on a farm. And she's talking about, you know, as soon as I'm done fixing the fence, I've got to go get the chickens and put them inside. And then there are the eggs. And then I've got to, and I've got to shear the sheep. And then I've got to make dinner. And then the kids are. And she said, it just keeps going. There's always something to do. And she was writing from like, God, I wish I could just be done with it. And like, there's no done. There's yeah. no done with it. But there doesn't have to be. That was the thing. Like, I felt the same way. Yeah. Just want to be done so I can start my retreat. There's no done. There's no done. And it's okay that there's no done. Uh, but I didn't know that until I knew it. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. I think I. Oh, so the way is to go about doing something crazy like that if you want to is you have to schedule everything and be really on it. So this is, wow. this is my second schedule. This was the slightly easier schedule. Uh, what I, so, so one of the things I was doing with, with lucid dreaming, I was trying to practice lucid dreaming. I actually had a few successes, which is amazing. I recommend it. Um, so the guy in his book said, we, we dream, our REM sleep, the amount that we dream goes higher, longer and longer as the night goes on. So by morning, you're having your longest dreams in the morning. So he said, if you want to learn to dream, you remember your dreams of lucid dream, do this. Go to sleep at 11, wake up at 5. Stay up from 5 to 7 and go back to sleep from 7 to 9 in the morning, which I love. I love doing that so much that sometimes I do it now not meaning to. It's fantastic. And it works as far as the dreaming thing goes. But uh, So this is the non-lucid dream schedule. So I'm actually getting up at 7 normally. At a certain point, I just when this all happens, like, okay, I, I can't... Even this was... I probably wasn't keeping this as well, but you get the idea. Like it, it was, I was trying to like get a lot in. Um, yeah. So this, this, yeah, it is done. You're right. Um, this is a picture of the, out the kitchen window, and I only put it here because this is where the meals start. I don't know if that's why. This is just, I got into a thing with my cousin, who I just, a cousin, a distant cousin I just met, and he was sending me pictures of food, so I just started doing it. Oh. So these are just, like, just, since, just the end, actually. These are just meals. Yeah. I ate really well. I was, like, super healthy. Not that I'm not super healthy here, but there I was, like, clean, clean. <laughs> okay, so there's a few more. Lucky you. Well, anyone can do this. Cooking is not hard. If you think cooking is hard, 
You need to talk to someone. It's really not hard. <laughs> I'm not saying me. I'm busy. <laughs> okay, that's that's me. Um, okay, good. Missing the caption at the bottom. Yeah. Einstein figures out that time equals money. <laughs> but I like this one a lot better, actually. What does that one say? We can't see. Uh, the top says what people think time is, and below it says what time actually is. Uh, I tried to blow these pictures up as much as I could so they'd be visible, but I can't go any higher than that goes into the so. I think the basic idea is that yeah. it's, 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 if it is anything, it's not what we think. <laughs> the next section is on music. I think I'm just going to jump to that for the sake of time. Oh. I'll close this section about doing and time by saying that uh, early on, probably around March, April, something like that, I got two calls from two separate people in one week. The first woman was calling to tell me that, so I, got, I ended up getting my BA through the uh, University of Illinois Macomb, an external de degree program, and I never actually got my diploma. And I get a call from a woman 30 years later saying, we just found your diploma. I don't actually found me and my number. Would you like it? Yeah, I'd like it. How did you, what? 30 years, that's a big crack for someone to fall through. Um, all right, so now, okay, that's cool. So she's going to send me my diploma. A week later, a friend calls and said he just got a letter returned from uh, my father in Florida to the address where I had been living, where he was a landlord for, in 2002. <laughs> I don't know, that's never happened to me before. And within one week, it seemed a little like, it seemed like something is clearing out here. I don't know what's going on, but, yeah. So, okay. So, on to music. Uh, music was one of the things I really wanted to uh, get a lot done with. Uh, but I, I haven't written much music in my life. I mean, I did go to music school for a little while. Most of my things I wrote were more like exercises in harmony and learning to put chords and notes together. I never sat down and actually composed a couple things, but not really in my life. I did write a wedding song uh, in Jerusalem. But uh, anyway, so that's something that was important for me to do. And, and, I, and I'll say now that it, it might be that I'm going to get choked up. I'm going to play it maybe some, if you want. And uh, I was thinking on the way over, so, so someone was at our house, and she had said, I never heard anything of yours. So while I was kind of getting dressed and doing it, I just put it on my computer so she could hear it, or with better speakers. And as certain texts are coming, I'm, I'm like getting teary, listening to my own music. And it's not because I think it's so awesome, like, how am I say this? Steve Pology and I just saw the, the Yiscock Perlman movie, at The Bijou, the other day. Uh, and at the end of this movie, he and his wife, his wife falls in love with him and asks him to marry her after seeing him play the first time. Like, she just got it. And he did. And uh, at the end, he's saying, I just feel, here we go. He says, I feel so grateful to have to be a person for whom that music affects so much. And I'm like, definitely, definitely. And, and uh, I feel that way. So I was, uh, I have a favorite Keith Jarrett song. I used to play in music school and I like to play it sometimes. I was playing on the piano there uh, last year. And there's this one passage where the chords, they're just, the way they do what they do is so remarkable, I just start crying from some chords on the piano that I'm playing. It's like, oh my god, this is just so, how do you do this? And it just seems to me like a, it's some kind of combination of the purest math, the purest harmony of, of elements, and some measure of heart or creativity, or I don't know how to say this. But music has, I know we all feel music, and it's awesome, but why? And to me, it's almost like the most personal thing you can do. The most personal thing I could offer, like as, as nice as this is, 
Like, I feel like the music is the most digested, it's the most pure thought. It, like, and you'll see the way I write, I'll describe it later. It's one note at a time. Like, it, it's, I'm a drummer. It, this, I don't play this piano. I, I, I put a chord, I don't play. Uh, but it comes out kind of full. And, it, and it's like, for any minister, not just me, it's the, it's the most unbelievably direct communication of what's in my mind and my heart out into the world. And whether, even though if no one hears it, if I hear it, it's like, wow, that was, I did that? Like, how did I do that? As a matter of fact, in the, in the, the first piece I, I hopefully will have time to play you, there's an organ solo. I decided in the middle of this piece, it needs to have an organ solo. There wasn't an organ in the piece before that, but I just thought, this needs an organ solo. So I put it in. And then, of course, we well, can't just put in an organ solo, and I've got to put in an organ for the rest of it. These things take months to do. It's ridiculous. Um, and after I did the solo, it's like something happened. And I couldn't believe it. I, didn't even have, did, I don't know where this came from. How, where, I've done, never done anything like this before. An organ is its own very particular thing anyway. And it got screwed up. Like the file got messed up, and the, the solo went away. I'm like, there's no way I could recreate that. It became very clear that it comes and it goes. Like, I didn't do it. And I couldn't do it again. I mean, I could do something again, but it wouldn't be that. So there's something very personal and non-personal at the same time. I don't know how to say it, but uh, anyway, so I went up there with the intention of doing that, of, of getting something out. Uh, so this is, I'm just throwing in pictures of some, of the, this is all done on software, it's all done on the computer, this is just one picture, this is like the mixing section of, of a song, just mostly to illustrate that this is all really complex, it was really hard for me, I had to learn it more than once, uh, it was hard. And I'm a tech guy, and it was still really hard. Um, yeah, so this is what it's like if you're trying to like get creative. Could you read it to us? Uh, yeah, so these two young people are talking, and the guy's saying, I got nothing. He says, dig, dig deep. Songwriting is about pain and desire. Where do you hurt? What do you want? And the guy says, my frisbee's on the roof. Let's dig deeper. <laughs> um, so uh, sometimes I'd write on the piano. And I would actually use theory, and I, and I would see the notes in front of me. But when I do it on the computer, I can't really see the notes. It's almost all by ear. And mostly I wrote that way. And then I have to like fix stuff if it didn't work out. Um, an interesting thing happened. I, I came up with this, I had this aha about the music writing process, which then quickly extrapolated to the rest of my life. But in looking over some old lessons from Berkeley, uh, when you're doing digital music, because it's computerized, you can control everything. The quality of each note, uh, everything. You can get to the, to the mi most minute thing. So it's easy to lose the forest for the trees. You can get so into one section or one note or one whatever that you can lose like what you're actually doing musically in the larger creative sense. And, and even in the lesson at Berkeley, he said, be careful of this thing. And then it happened and I came right across this afterwards. Like, yeah, it's true. So uh, I found that, especially if I wasn't, if I wasn't operating correctly, harmonically, I could have two measures that sounded really good, but then when I looked at the whole thing, it's like, ugh, God, pitch, I pitched a lot of stuff. Um, and that was why, that was mostly why. I, I would lose track of what I was doing, and I, I would do that in a piece, and also some of the pieces I wrote was also losing track of what I wanted to do, what my musical vision was, the kind of music I wanted to do. So the whole thing was just moving forward almost like I'm just, I thought I was in charge, but I wasn't, and that, that's, one of the big lessons from this whole thing is like, okay, it is what it is. So, which is one of the reasons I don't feel worse about it. I would feel really badly about not having, I wanted to have 10, 10 completed pieces. A year, that doesn't seem so hard. A month for a piece, but uh, I didn't. I had like two or three and then a bunch of uncompleted ones, which I will complete. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, I think I called this one um, uh, composing by pen. You know, I couldn't find a pencil, and so everything I just, would just get all scratched out and marked up, because, um, yeah. Um, um, I think I'm going to skip the next thing I'm going to talk about, not necessary. Yeah. So, br briefly, I'll just say that uh, I'm doing this because it's there for me to do. I don't really... While I, I have a kind of a dream or a vision of what I'd like it to be, the chances actually that, that any of the music I write, this or, or anything else, 
actually becoming something that I could play out in a larger venue, probably just the chances are, are not good. And I could go into why, but uh, a lot of it's just luck, actually. And I've had people, Berkeley professors, tell me that of late. Like, they can't even find places to play. It's like, it's just, you have to be good looking for one thing, you know? You're just not going to get out of it. <laughs> um, but, I did, but I did come up with, with a, a calculation. I thought, if somehow, of course it's somehow, a million people could hear something I wrote, and of all those people, half of them like it. And of those people, 2% liked it enough to come to a show or buy a CD. That's 10,000 people. <laughs> so, okay, so I, it kind of keeps the hope a little bit alive, but really. <laughs> uh, I think I'm jumping ahead. Th yeah, there's my calculation. That, that's my name for my band if it ever happens. <laughs> I'm at it now. Um, one of the things that happened that is, is good uh, to notice, that it was good to notice, was I'd, be, I'd get stuck. Like, I, 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 I wouldn't know what to do next musically. I'm trying to make a transition or come up with a B section or whatever. And I didn't feel like I could leave what I was doing until I did that. And it's, like, it's time to work out, it's time to eat, whatever. Like, I can't. I, I can't. I, it won't be there. I've got to do it while it's there. But that was never the case. Every time I said, you know what? You know, it, this is all like, it's just a series of problems. It's like you have this thing, it's like, oh, how am I going to do that? Oh, oh that'll work, okay. And it's just one thing at a time, just plodding forward. So if I come to a stopping point, it's like, it's still there. I can go away and come back, oh, the problem's still there. I still have to work through it. And it usually, usually, especially if I sleep on it, I'm actually better able to do it the next time. Sometimes I'll wake up with the answer. It happened a lot. So that was really nice to know that you don't have to, I don't have to be so... What's the word? Attached to doing it now. It's like, it's going to work out. It's going to, you know, like, don't worry about it. Um, so, would you like to hear a song? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so, the only thing I'm going to say to you about this song is that uh, the, the, the two melody instruments are, are like, there's the two horns. The intention is that they're sung. You're hearing vocals. And maybe I'll even jump to the lyrics, which you're not going to be able to read. Um, the theme is nice. I think some of the lyrics are pretty weak, and I'd be happy to have help on my attached to these lyrics. So I had one melodic <coughs> idea, or like a rhythmic idea, and the, the, all I had was change is coming. Change is coming. That's it. That's it. That was the entire idea. And it became this sort of like this political anthem. I don't know why it became that. It just didn't. So I said, okay. I just kept going until it was done. It took a long time. <coughs> No, that's all I'm going to say. So let's see if I can get this going from here. If not, I'm going to ask for Mike's help. Uh, which one's which? DB. Okay, let's see. So this is called Changes Coming. This is closer to what I think I more want to write these days. It's a little bit more rocking. Uh, the other one, if we get a t time to play, is a little less rocking, but you'll get it anyway. So.
say one thing about this that's very interesting, that uh, making digital music, there are a lot of things that you do to it after it's done to make it sound like acoustic music. There's all the stuff that we hear that we're not aware that we're hearing, like when you have two instruments there coming from different parts of the room and they interact and they're making sounds in the air. None of this is made in the air. So people add all kinds of effects. There's all these things to do afterwards to make it sound good. Well, I'm not good at any of that. Post-production, mixing, all that stuff is a whole other profession. It's ridiculously hard. Uh, my own music school teacher, the dean of technology of Berkeley College of Music gets some, someone else to mix for him. It's like, he says, it's not hard. It's really, really hard. So I felt a little bit better about that, but um, that's why it doesn't sound like a regular CD you might own at home. Uh, and at first, I, that put me through a lot, because I couldn't get it to come, it, I mean, it sounded good. It kind of like took the wind out of my sails. Um, but good enough is good. So I'm going to just jump forward, because we're really running late, and Joel's going to come over here and hit me with something. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to, uh, so right around April, May of last year, so the first four months, uh, this whole, I, I know I'm somewhat talking out of order in terms of the way things happen, but it's hard to do it. So I started to just break down. Like, I just couldn't keep going the way I was going, and I just started forgetting things. Like, I had started, one thing I started doing was this thing called the 100 push-up challenge where every, every day you do like a small number of push-ups but frequently and you build yourself up to where you can eventually do 100. And the end of the day would come, it's like, I didn't do any push-ups. Like, I was doing it for like weeks and it just, um, and I, I had this really well-developed like uh, regime of supplements and I was taking the digestive enzyme when I ate and stuff like this and I just stopped taking my pills. I had to literally, before I started cooking, I had to take the pill out and put it on my dish or I wouldn't take it. Like, I just couldn't remember stuff. Um, it, it was like, something was just breaking down. There were a lot of things like that. I was even having dreams. I had, I was thinking, like I said, an hour is not enough to do this, but I, I have like 30 plus, 35 pages of, of dreams that, that I typed up. And a handful of them were about being in a situation where I would just be completely unprepared. Like I'd show up somewhere, we were gonna go, like we were gonna go hiking. And I walk in, everybody else has got their tent and their boots and they're doing this stuff. I walk in with my shorts, I'm like, I don't have anything. I don't have a canteen. I have nothing. <laughs> and so it, it, on the one hand, I feel like kind of free in some of my dreams. On the other hand, I felt like that's really interesting. I'm just like thoroughly unprepared. And, and a couple times I did things even in real life. Like, um, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, a couple times I left the house, I didn't shut the garage door. I was just be gone. Uh, one time for a long time. Like, that, you know, the house was open. Out in the, anyone could, it was right next to a road, too. One time I was, I was going to be going to Florida. The short version of the story is, uh, I put my suitcase out, and I drove away. Oh. And I'm on my way to Hartford, and I decided to stop near this really nice lake, maybe just five miles from there, right? I'm sitting by the lake, and I'm getting ready to go. I'm like, what's wrong? Something's wrong. Something's wrong. I didn't put the suitcase in the car. I would have got to the airport. Like, so shit like that was happening. It was like, it wasn't just, I, I, I felt unprepared. I was unprepared. Like something was just stopped working. And I had to be, like I wouldn't go out the door without locking it. Like from the inside. Like, like there were doors like going out of like the kitchen door. Every time I used it, I'd lock it because I'd be afraid I wouldn't lock it later because I just couldn't remember stuff. Um, so it's partially getting old and partially it's stuff was, something was breaking down. Uh, and, uh, I don't know what more I want to say about this, but um, it, it, there was a feeling of, of scariness about it. I just felt like I talked to a friend on the phone, and he said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm flailing. I feel like I'm flailing. I don't know what to do. I, I'm just, I'm sitting, I'm doing some stuff, but it's like, it just seems like I'm just doing it because it's on my schedule, not because I'm, I'm actually connected to it. Um, at the, I, I think it was a, a important that I... I go through whatever that was, but at the time, I thought, th this is not good. And this is also leading right up to the time, oh, okay, here we go. So the next section is called Parents. I'm not going to say much about this because I don't have time, but uh, we had a bit of a family drama happen in our house where, uh, so I visited my parents in January. That was going to be the last time. Then my mother called. She said, you know, Mark, we're having Passover dinner. Your father's not well. This will probably be the last one. Wouldn't you come down? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Ma. Yeah, I'll come. Yeah. 
She's got me, boy. She's got me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a direct flight from Albany. It's only three hours. Come on. I'm like, okay, I'll come. And I did. As an aside, I don't know if you, for those of you who are Jewish or not, it was by far the worst Seder in my life. It was bad. I would almost not go on just to avoid that moment. It was terrible. Uh, then, then, oh, the, the picture, the ever important picture that sort of, um, I, you know, I have to look up here, I can see it here. Okay, so this is my parents, they're all already up in Lenox. So this is my mom and dad, Larry and Edie, they're 90-ish. Um, my dad looks good there, but he, he doesn't think so well. Um, so this is uh, one of the bedrooms in South Florida, in their home of 55 plus years, that one day, while my mother was actually in the room, that happened. Oh, okay. That's actually the cleaned up version. And what it turned out was a tree had fallen earlier on that roof and made a little dent, and water had gotten in, and termites had gotten in. And the roof, once they did this, this, they started looking around, was infested. Infested with termites. So bad, they had to move. Irre irreparable without redoing the whole roof. So it's like, okay. God's cracking up at this point. You know? so, ha, ha. That's funny. Um, so, uh, so I had to go down there again in June to, to be with my siblings and help them pack up all their belongings and get rid of some and do a state sale and this, this whole thing. Um, yeah. So, uh, so that's getting ahead a little bit. So, so, that, so then my brother, who's a realtor, worked to find them a condo nearby that they, that they are now renting. Places like the palace. And, um, but because of timing and stuff, well, timing and, so, so because their stuff hadn't been moved yet, they thought, well, the perfect thing to do is like, while they're moving and everything, while well, they just come up to Lex. <laughs> but you said, you, know, yeah. you said you weren't coming. But I couldn't say no, I mean, it is their house. Um, that, there's that detail that keeps coming back. So it went back and forth and back and forth, and finally they decided to come. And one of the reasons they decided to come is at the same time as that was happening, Florida got hit with uh, the worst hurricane uh, ever. I put a little ahead there. Wow. Yeah, that's actually that's actually a previous hurricane. The one that just hit was worse than that one. So they, we're like we're getting out of here. We can't. Um, so they came, and so did Buddy. My brother came up. So and there's Ariana. She came too. So uh, that's my niece Rachel. She flew up with them just because she, my mom can't fly with my dad because he doesn't keep it together too well. And uh, the reason I put in that picture following is I, as soon as they arrived, I, I thought I'm losing my sanity. Yeah. And uh, for a composer, that might be good, but uh, yeah. So. So, uh, so essentially what I'll say about this is, uh, while I had every good intention of doing this for my mother and, and being with her uh, and helping her um, and actually having the opportunity to be with her in a way that I haven't in really most of my adult life and I won't probably again, um, I felt invaded. I, like my space, like, like the agreement was, okay, well, but you'll leave me with my space, right? Not. Not. Uh, so something in me just said, well, screw it then. Screw it. And I just dropped everything. Like, I didn't sit, I didn't write any music. I was just like, that's it, fine. I'll just be with them, whatever. Um, yeah, so I have a streak in me. I don't have time. Uh, I don't do crazy. I can't deal with crazy people or crazy things. I just, it's just a thing of mine. So my dad comes up, and he's crazy. He's, for example, uh, so Rachel was there. And so I go to Hartford. I meet them in Hartford. And I drive them back. You know, I don't have to drive. The whole time he's complaining in the car why he's even there because he didn't remember about any of this. Uh, he didn't remember the, the, he didn't remember they had termites. There's a gash in the ceiling in their living room, and every I probably told him a dozen times, Dad, you have termites. Go in the living room and look. And he just wouldn't remember. Like that bad. It's it's mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. so anyway, so he's complained to Rachel about something about his computer, and she says to him, Well, just ask Mark, he'll help you. He says, Well, Mark's not here. I, I just left the kitchen five minutes ago. I had just driven them there. He didn't remember I was even in the house, that I was even in Lennox. So I just lost it. I just, not that he was forgetful, but he was ornery. He's like, he, he's, he, my dad is the definition of arrogance. It's like I've never met anybody remotely. As a matter of fact, psychologically, he's been tested by a friend of the family. And he is. Like, he believes he can do anything, and, he, and he, everything he thinks is right. 
Never mind. I, I, never mind. Anyway, I, I, I lost it. I lost it. I'll just say that. I lost it. And um, the only reason I put in that, that, uh, that slide there is that we, we did some cultural things together. We went to shows. We went to movies. We went out to dinner. I, I didn't go out to dinner at all when I was alone. Then I'm like living it up. We went to a museum. I'm just going to show you this one because this blew me away. This is a, an 18th century uh, marble sculpture called the Veiled Rebecca. This is done in stone. Is that insane? Oh my god. That's stone, marble. I was like, that was it for me for the night. I'm like, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I thought I'd just share that one. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I'm zooming ahead here because I want to I honor Joel and my commitment to be on time. And I have one more piece of music if there's time, but I'm not going to argue for it. Although it's better than the last one. Okay. It is. Um, Okay, this is the end before the last section. Um, we had uh, the last section. The end before the last section. The, the end, yeah, yeah. The last section is really about events. It's more just like my takeaways. So <clears throat> I got to get to this picture. So I'm back to loving nature and blah blah. I'm just jumping ahead. I'm not going to read you that. Okay. <clears throat> So I went out shopping once, and I had a moment of weakness. I bought a box of Ike and Mike's, you know, candies, right? <clears throat> and after a day of it, it's sitting in the fridge. I'm like, Mark, why did you do that, you know? And I just dumped them in the garbage. And, and then, so there's a bit of preface to this. I found that there were, I find these little turds in this drawer, just this one drawer. There was no sign of mice anywhere except that one drawer. Uh, not even that bad normally. And I, I, I emptied out the drawer. I said, okay, they want that drawer, they can have it. Sometimes I even put some nuts in there. Yeah. So oh. every once in a while I'd open the drawers just to see what they were up to. And I found these and they had gone into the garbage and they walked them all up and like had this oh. party uh, in the drawer. And I thought that was the cutest thing. I just thought that was adorable. <laughs> like, you know, it's festive, right? Um, so I sent this picture to my, to my brother and he freaked out. He's like, you've got a contagion. You've got a poison. You've got a, you know. Yeah. I'm like, they're two little mice. I've not even seen them. They're like, there's no problem here. He thought they're in the dishes. They're in everything. I'm like, they're not. I don't even see them. This is the only, anyway, he insisted that because it's not my house and they do come up there for vacation, blah, 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 you have to get rid of them. I'm like, I really don't want to. They're really not a problem. They're cool. There's nothing going on here. But I felt compelled to. I wrestled with this for a week. I felt like, I had, just, I had just heard this talk about uh, what happened to the American Indians. I was had an American empire on my mind. I felt like I'm the, em the empire here, destroying these little guys just because they happen to be... There's no poop anywhere in the house other than that drawer. And so you get this stuff. You know, go and they have this stuff that you, the, the mice eat, and it makes them really thirsty, and they go outside and they die. That's what's supposed to happen. So I put it, I put it, I put some in the drawer, I put it around, you know, it's this stuff they eat. And, I come in, I'm just really hoping the whole time, please just go outside and die. I really, and I come in with some, oh. and there's, <laughs> this cute little beautiful brown mouse, done, right there, can't even walk, can't run away. I'm like, <sighs> I hated myself. I kind of put him outside, I put him in the snow, and I guess he died a little bit faster. Uh, because it was cold, and, and, then, and then another one happened, the other one, there were two mice. I know this, it might be funny to some, funny to some but I was actually really upset about it. Mm -hmm. I was really pissed at my brother that he made me do it. So, next comes, oh, so something I didn't tell you before this part of the story, is on that trip when I went to Florida the first time, I, I had found some popcorn uh, that was, the story's not going to be as good because I didn't tell this part first. Uh, uh, in, in the cupboard, but it wasn't organic, so I wasn't going to eat it. So I, but I've always liked those things. You put like you put pebbles and popcorn or something, and you can put pens in it, and they'll stand up. So I did that. I had like a little plastic thing with popcorn in it on my desk. In the office, 50 yards from the kitchen. I come back from this trip, and I walk in, and it's two-thirds of it's gone. None of it's spilled. None, it's just, oh, the mice. I don't know how they found it, but the mice ate the popcorn, huh? So I'm, 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 I'm packing up the room. This is the end now. I'm packing up, and I'm taking the speakers down, and I put it down there. Shh. <laughs> Shh. Oh. Whoa, whoa, what happened? Like something dissolved, the speakers are messed up. Damn. I'm like, so what of course happened, 
Oh, <laughs> nice. Check out how, can you see how, how much, it's hundreds of kernels in each one, in each speaker. I don't know how they did this. Taking, how many, they could store in their mouths, whatever, crawling down, up a pole, the speaker's in your plate, getting around the plate, climbing up, it's all plastic, and into the hole in the back, hundreds of times. These are the mice I killed. They're miraculous, amazing animals. Like, oh my God, these guys, they should be on a plaque, not in a, you know, <laughs> cemetery. Yeah. Anyway, the end. Um, I've already said some of this. Uh, I'm going to, so some things have been different for me since I've been back. I didn't do Aikido for pretty much the whole last year. And uh, coming back, like, Aikido is actually better than it was when I left. And uh, Aikido is, is a spiritual practice that was developed by, in a way, person. And the, the whole thing that makes it work is allowing. Allowing what's happening and not opposing what's happening. You don't want to force your partner to do something. You want to just be a certain way and they respond to your, how you're being. There's a million ways to say this, but uh, mainly what I want to say about it is that uh, it's really good to have a practice of some kind that's physical, in my opinion, by which you can measure your energetic or psychological responses to things. Because if it's all just in your head, that's too amorphous. But if someone grabs you and you tighten up, you're very aware and they're aware. You're aware that they're, like, you, you could experience it all. So Aikido and Sistema and Tai Chi and all these kinds of things, Qigong, um, are really good. I'll add also that I think one of the reasons my practices broke down was I, I'd stopped doing exercise enough. And for me, at least, if I'm not in my body, like actively, frequently, it just, I can't get down. Like, I just, it just keeps, it keeps spinning. So uh, that was good to know and experience really directly. Okay, so here's the final takeaway. This is the last two pages, I'm done. Uh, so the theme of this uh, talk is remembering, or remembering to remember. But as I thought about this more, I realized that the reason it's hard to remember it's hard to remember to remember, either way, is that we don't really want to. Or part of us doesn't really want to remember, and that's why it's hard. It's not hard because we couldn't write notes on the wall or whatever. We're resistant uh, to, um, or some part of us, the I is resistant to remembering what is, and what it is or what it isn't, you know. But there's a struggle that goes on there. Give me a second, I don't want to say this right. What I want to say about remembering, my takeaway, this is how I feel about it, is that there's nothing we can really do about not remembering. We can't force ourselves to remember. But what we can do is allow ourselves to remember. Like, we can't force ourselves to do anything, and we shouldn't try to force ourselves to do anything, because that's just more of the very thing that we're trying to remember that we're not, in, in, in a way. So I realized that remembering is, is, is much less active than I thought it was, much less intentional, and much more like, I'm going to let that in, I'm going to let that be there. Um, and that might seem, because of all the talking about it, we do hear like completely self-evident, but it, it was an aha for me. And, uh, and I actually think in, uh, as fast as I am, I'm really <coughs> slow in certain ways. And um, here's an example of resistance to awareness. Um, I bought, I'm not wearing it now, uh, a thing that I found, it's a little thing you put on your back right here, and it sticks on your back. And you program it so that if you hunch over, you bend over, it buzzes. Oh. And it lets you know if, you're, if your posture isn't good. So I bought this thing, I program it, I tell it to go, I put it on my back, great, right? And every time it buzzes, I'm like, God damn it, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. you know? I'm, I'm angry at it for doing the very thing I asked it to do. Why would that be? I think the reason it would be is like I'm resistant to, to experiencing the thing that, you know, part of me wants to know, part of me just doesn't want to know. So. There are more examples, I'll, I'll leave it at that. For myself, maybe it's not true for you guys, but for me, there's a lot going on, and we can't fight it. I can't fight it. Like, I spent a whole year trying to fight it, or fight for it, or fight for something. It just doesn't work. Uh, another thing that doesn't work, in terms, and la this is the last thing, I think. I, mean, this, this is a, uh, I just had this aha at, at the, with some of my friends, I went to the coast and had a, an aha. And this is the last one. Um, I spent a lot of time reading. I spent a lot of time reading and trying to understand things. For me, it's really important. I think Mike might have been the, the best mouthpiece for why that doesn't work. It, he once said something to me that was fantastic, but it didn't really stick, of course. And um, I'm sitting there at the ocean, and 
really open. And it's just coming in. It's, I mean, it's a little alcove away from the wind. It's coming in. The waves are coming and going. I'm just, all of a sudden, it's like, it just doesn't work. I've given it my best. I feel like I, I gave it my best, you know? But all this study and all this reading, all this trying to understand, it's not making me feel more settled or more at home in myself or in the world or whatever. It's just not the way. So that, I don't think would have happened if I didn't have the last year. So while it wasn't a really a retreat, it kind of was. You know, it's not the retreat I would do the next time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, so, all right, so Oriana sent me, and then this is really the last thing, uh, a poem that she thought, this is the goodbye. I cried when I saw this box. Like, the packing up and leaving was, like, really hard. I didn't know until I did it. Um, five minutes. Yeah. Um, you're not going to be able to read that. I'm going to read it to you. I, it's, I'm just bringing it up here. All right, I'll just read it. So this is called Getting There. This is the last thing. Thank you, Oriana, for submitting this to me. <coughs> you take a final step. I'm not really this without crying, I think. You take a final step and look. Suddenly, you're there. You've arrived. <coughs> At the one place all of your drudgery was aimed for. This common ground where you stretch out, pressing your cheek to sandstone. What did you want? To be? You'll remember soon. You feel like tinder under a burning glass, a luminous point of change. The sky is pulsing against the cracked horizon, holding it firm till the arrival of stars, in time with your heartbeats. I can't believe you found this. I mean, I was like, I, I should have written this. It's just like, I said, I'm not that good. <laughs> Though your traces on a map would make an un unpromising, meandering lifeline. What have you learned so far? You'll find out later. I'm telling it haltingly. Like this. Like a dream, like a dream that lost traveler's dream until the last hill where you thought the night, where through the night, you'll take your time out of mind to unburden yourself of elements along elementary paths by the break of morning. <clears throat> You've earned this worn down, hard, incredible sight called here and now. Now, what you make of it means everything, it means starting over. The life in your hands is neither here nor there, but getting there. So you're standing again and breathing, beginning another journey without regret, forever being your own unpeaceable kingdom, the end of endings. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah, thank you for that. So uh, we normally leave time for questions and answers, and we don't really have time now. Uh, I have another piece of music I will play for you. Uh, if you want, but we really do want right, to. You actually should have, not play the music, have questions and answers, right. at least a few. Right. And I'm going to, I'm in work very much in my body right now. I'm going to get rid of some of it. <laughs> I, I, hope, I, hope, I hope the talk was helpful in that regard. So, comments or questions? What about um, meditating when you work and that part of forgetting things? Did you kind of forget your precepts or your meditation and... How did that go? You mean during the retreat? Uh, but that point when you just, it just dropped away. It, it dropped away right before my parents came. Before they got there, but then for a while it was, it was hard for me to get it back. I mean, I was sitting, but like, it was almost like it wasn't working really. Uh, and then, then it started to, but it took a long time to get it back. I was surprised. How long? Months. Back to November before I felt, November, December, before I felt like, okay. Not that my schedule, I wasn't doing it. It's not like I wasn't sitting. I was, but like it just wasn't working. I don't know what to say about it. It wasn't working. Yeah. What was your intention for the retreat? What? What was my intention for the retreat? <laughs> uh, well, my unconscious intention, my unconscious intention was to try and complete everything in my life that I had not completed. Today, that was my only conscious intention. I knew that was. I thought that was part of it, but I didn't really know what a large percentage of it that was. Which that alone was interesting. How could you not know a thing like that? Um, especially when you're just showing up with like lots of like, stuff. Um, uh, my, I didn't actually know. I, I felt like there was something for me in the space. If given enough time, given enough space something would reveal itself. It was more like something's going to reveal itself. I didn't have a specific intention other than to try and do my program even better. Mm -hmm. About 
when you went to Florida and you said it was the worst gathering with your family ever. We're safe. Yeah. We're safe. Um, do you think it was the worst because you were more aware? No, 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 definitely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mother's not even Jewish. My mother converted. Oh. She's Italian. I'm half Sicilian. Well, um, safe you? I, I was interested no, I'm, about I'm completely you. sure. Okay, okay yeah. but I'm interested in what what made it the worst and did your retreat time um, uh, change you in such a way so that you your awareness changed so that if that were to happen again you might be more at peace with it? That's a lot of questions, but just uh, was it that it was it was not my, my experience of the, of the of the Seder being awful was not because I was more aware or anything like that. It's because basically everybody there had no relationship to it. Basically having dinner. Like, why are we even, why are we all reading this stuff? Why are we even doing this? If, I had to actually break in one point and say, do we want to do this? The reason was that people weren't, weren't being observant at all, at all. That was the reason. As far as next time, I'd like to believe I've learned a few lessons on what to do and not to do and what to say yes to and what not to. But I seem to be somewhat, you know, both willing and susceptible to my mother's, I really want to help her. I mean, she's, I, the, the phrase I've used recently is like, my mother's in prison doing hard time. She ha she's with my father all the time. Like, I would have killed him by now. Literally. I, I could not do it. So, anything I can do to make her life easier, she's, and all, she's old, so all her friends are dead also. Or most of them are dead. So she has no one even to go hang out with when she goes out. It's, it's really hard. It's a really sad thing. So I'm doing mostly what I do for her. So, yeah. If you did another one-year retreat, what did you learn from this one? And how would the next one be different? I, I, I wouldn't even remotely attempt a one-year retreat like I think a retreat should be. I, I, don't, I, would, I could imagine a month retreat. But a real retreat. You know, the, the retreat where like everything's done for you and you don't have to do all your own shopping and cleaning and setting up and everything. It's like you're going and there's nothing to do. No computer, no books, no nothing. You know, I would do that. I wouldn't do another year retreat unless it was... I had done a bunch of one-month retreats first. Mm -hmm. Doc, do you have a suspicion, even if you did that, life would still occur? I mean, it's so delicious, you know, the, kind of, the question, like, what would you do different? And, I mean, every, I, I, one of the things I take away from this is that delicious little drawer with all the good and plenties in it. And the, I mean, it's going to happen, it just seems to me. That, that I want to hear how it is when you do your next year. Retreat. I, you'll be the first one to I'll call. <laughs> <laughs> um, remembering, we're talking with you yesterday, yeah. and also hearing it now Sorry. a couple of times, remembering. So, uh, repetition helps me remember, so thank you for repeating. <laughs> but I'm asking myself, and maybe this is for you too, and maybe for others in the room, what is there some a sense there's something more there, like why that's important to you, or what it is that's important to remember. Okay, or good, that's good. I, because it was late, it got to the end, I spent too much time talking about the, de the external details and not enough the intro. I'll just say this much, because this came up a number of times. Just briefly. So sometimes we talk about mirror mirroring here. Right? We, we use the concept of the mirror and how, how that can be a helpful way to look at what's going on. And the, one of the reasons that metaphor is used is because it removes the person and the activity of the person from whatever the, the, is going on. You're just mirroring. You're not trying to affect anything. You're just basically watching. So that's, why I, that's one of the reasons I said I don't think remembering is an activity, per se. I mean, it is. because. Among other reasons, we live in a relative world and nothing is absolute. But I think ultimately, the less active it can be, the more effective it can be when it's there. So what I want to remember is, I got this from Joel on a retreat. I think, I'm not, he gave me this impromptu answer that I thought was so brilliant. I'm like, I can't believe you just did that off the top of your head. That was like, unbelievable. So, I, you know, he, he'd, uh, you know, sometimes he'll, he'll say... I don't remember. No, no, well, I'll, 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 so, so he'll, um, he'll say, uh, so where is yourself? Can you find it? Where is it in yourself, this eye? Does it have a color? Does it have a shape? Does it have a weight? Where's the location of it? Of course, no one can answer that. Does it have any qualities? 
And afterwards, I went over to him, you know, after we were breaking up, I said, Joel, it does have a quality. I think it's magnetic. And he said, you're right. It is magnetic. But it's better if you look at it as more mirror-like. It's not, it's more like what I got from what you said. I'm not sure what you meant, but it's really profound to me, is that it's mirroring back where I am. So if I'm there efforting, it's, I'm going to say this. I'm going to get back what I put into it, or where I am. And part of the value of the mirror is, okay, I can see where I am. But the more energy I put into that, it's going to feed back. The less I can put into it, the less I it's going to feed back, and the more space is going to be there. So the thing I want to remember is that. I mean, how many times you say it ten times every time we meet? The same thing. I'm not complaining. I don't get it. So it's good. Repetition's good. That I, I even have, oh, I'm not going to be able to find it. He said, like, the, the I, this poor little self, it just wants to be free. You know, it, want, it wants to be free, and we hold it by being attached to it. We keep it from being free. Um, don't hold anything. Don't hold anything. Allow, allow everything. So the thing I want to remember is that. But what, what a better way to remember to allow than to have the remembering itself be allowed? I don't know if I can say it better. It's a great thing to get on tape. I want to hear it it's a few more tape. times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to be respectful. I may even just leave it to Joel. It's four minutes to one. Comments, questions? I just want to make a quick comment about the remembering thing, just because of how your talk impacted me. And it felt like there were almost these two layers of remembering what I was getting, is remembering ourselves in terms of our, our complexes and our neuroses and all the things that get in our way. I'm trying to forget that stuff. And then this deeper remembering that I felt every time, even, every time I teared up, even before you teared up, mm. and then you teared up, the remembering of yourself when you stood on that porch and beheld, and yeah. remembering, remembering of yourself when you saw those mice and cared about them, and just the remember, and that's a bigger suffering in that remembering of who we really are. And, and, and that was what was so beautiful about this, is seeing that, mm. this remembering of, of this death. And, and anyway, I just feel a great appreciation. Okay. Thank, you. Mark, so thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, the, I said this before, but I'll just say it again. It, it really felt to me, in the aggregate, like it just happened. It all just happened. Like I can't believe I was there three months ago. It right. seems like years ago to me, and it went by so fast. The, it all just happened. Um, and at, at first I was fighting that. It's like, but no, that, that is what's happening in a strange kind of way. So, yes, I'm remembering myself, but that's not actually what I'm, yes and no. Yeah, yeah right, so multiple yeah. levels. It's, I don't want to try and yes. parse it out now. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.